floor is yours, Matt. Thank you. Okay. I think I'm going to try to just sit here and have it be more of an interactive conversation. If for some reason you can't see me or hear me, let me know, and I'll um, try to shift around. I thought what I would do is um, just kind of give you a little review of where we've been, which I'm sure a lot of this legislation you kind of lived through, so it'll be kind of familiar to you. But I thought I would kind of just give you my general sense of you know, how things have been progressing and then kind of where we are today. And then I think we just open it up to a general conversation about um, questions you might have about, you know, how to interact with the legislature, how to influence the legislature, um, how to deal with your own um, state senator, state representative, um, any of those kinds of questions we can talk about um, as you kind of think about how you can influence the process or have your voice be heard. I can kind of give you some tips on that. So. I mean, as you know, the most dramatic change that impacted um, those who work in access and cable television in general was the deregulation bill of 2006, which it's hard for me to believe it's been um, a decade already since that passed. Time is going um, really fast. And I opposed that legislation and, and uh, railed against it a fair amount because I kind of saw the handwriting on the wall by essentially taking the power of local communities to try to have some impact on the way their cable systems operated and have, have a more direct input, particularly on customer service and things. I just knew you were not going to get that from the state level. And all that was really going on there was pretty straightforward. Is AT&T decided they wanted to enter the video business. They did not want to go and negotiate with every community and have every community say, here's what's important to us. And the community might say, we want to access television. The community might say, we'd like you to help fund some capital um, projects to make that access possible. They did not want to have to put up with local communities expressing what they needed for their local communities. So their answer was simple, was to come to the legislature and say, hey, if you really want all these great advanced telecommunications services, you need to get those terrible locals out of the way who are being mean and not allowing us to come into their community. They're throwing up barriers that are protecting that evil cable monopoly. That was basically the message that AT&T sent. And uh, they had a lot of think tanks. Indiana at that time in 2006 was uh, kind of a test state because they had gotten legislation similar to what happened in Indiana passed in Texas. That was kind of the first place. And they were coming up to Indiana to see if they could begin to get some momentum going for every state to do this, to basically get the local governments out of the oversight of the cable systems. And so when they came to um, Indiana, they made these most ridiculous, outlandish promises about what was going to happen. I mean, they said, if you do this, you're going to be the tech mecca of the world because everyone looked at Indiana and realized because you've lowered the barriers to entry and regulation, you're going to have all this, not just cable service coming, but all kinds of, you know, internet related stuff. They said, you're going to get 40,000 high paying tech jobs if you pass this bill. And you'd ask them about that. And it was some think tank took some study that was probably bogus to begin with and then conflated that with some other stuff. And so they basically got the legislature to buy into the idea that if you um, get the locals out of the way, reduce regulation, make it pretty much all you have to do is fill out a postcard to provide cable in Indiana and go ahead and pay the franchise fee and put the peg channels on the system if somebody's already there doing it. That was basically the bottom line of what they had to do. And the idea was that was going to create this, um, you know, a tremendous investment in the state of Indiana and in infrastructure and all these new high-tech jobs, which um, has not happened. And um, the, uh, it's interesting because AT&T, for several years after that bill passed, they had this um, tremendous public relations machine going where every time they added a single job or put a new cell phone tower up anywhere, they would say, because Indiana passed this deregulation bill, you're getting a new cell tower in your community, or you're getting, we're going to put a new call center in. And I would point out to people that, you know, the wireless side of their business was never regulated by the state and has absolutely nothing to do with any of the deregulation bills. But they knew they had to create the illusion that the bill had accomplished what it was supposed to. And so at and in particular, you can go back and look at the press clips from, you know, 2006, 7, 8. Anytime they did anything to expand their wireless business, which was, as you know, people were all getting their cell phones back then, so it's scaling up greatly. So if they needed a call center, 
do customer service for their wireless side, they would have a big announcement, say, hey, Evansville's getting a big call center, and it's all because of this deregulation bill. And you kind of say, like, really? I mean, it's totally unrelated. But to the average person, you know, what do they know? It's all telecommunications kind of thrown it together. So that was kind of where, um, you know, we settled out. And even though the cable industry in its own self-interest opposed the deregulation bill because they were kind of the incumbents, they had already negotiated their deals, and they, and, you know, it kind of served their interest to have AT&T have to negotiate with the local communities. Once the deregulation bill was in place, they kind of like, went fully with it to take advantage of it. So as you know, um, they tried to get out of whatever obligations they had under those old existing franchises as they moved to the, um, to the state franchise. And uh, one of the things that became an issue, as you know, were, were the franchise fees themselves, which have, which have had an interesting history. Because as you know, cable kind of started out as this little cottage industry in these places that couldn't get broadcast television. and. Um, the people on the federal level really didn't care about it. And so things kind of developed more as a contractual kind of thing where these local appliance store operators would say, well, nobody can get TV around here. We can't sell any televisions unless somebody gets some cable. So we want to put a big antenna up on top of the hill or on a tower, put some amplifiers in, and you know, run some coax into people's houses so they can buy TVs from us. And in order to do that, we've got to use your rights of way. We've got to cross your streets, maybe on poles or dig underneath or something, and we'd like to get some kind of agreement on that. And obviously, most of the local officials at that point, it's like, well, anything to get television in here is a great thing. And over time, it's like, okay, there's going to be some cost to maintaining the rights of way. There's a value to that. You basically kind of need to rent the facility, so why don't you give us um, some percentage of your gross revenues? And that kind of informally <coughs> is how um, franchise fees kind of developed. And uh, and in the 70s and 80s, the state and federal governments were kind of catching up as cable TV evolved from just a community antenna television system to actually a provider of unique content from all these different cable networks. And um, so as Congress began to figure out how does it want to structure cable television, first in 1984 and then again in 1992 and somewhat in 96, and that 84 law, the... Uh, issue of franchise fees came up, and the National League of Cities really worked hard to make sure that whatever um, Congress did and the way it structured these franchises, that they would not lose their franchise fees. That was their number one um, priority. And so they kind of officially put into the federal law that that's something that could be negotiated for is the use of franchise fees. But at the same time, the uh, Senator, then Senator Trent Lott from Mississippi who went on to become the majority leader of the Senate for a time, he uh, put a provision in, I think it was the 84 bill, um, that gave the, lo the cable companies the right to itemize the franchise fee on the bottom of the bill and basically characterize it as a tax. So that's kind of the first beginning of um, you know, how you frame the issue and politically how it pans out. So it's one thing to say, the cable company usually had a monopoly, but your cable company's in town making a lot of money. They're using your streets and alleyways. They should have to pay you some rent for that, so we're going to have a fee based on your gross revenues. That became a different description. Now it was your local government wants to tax your cable company, and that tax just gets passed on to you. So really the franchise fee is just the local government taxing you, the cable subscriber. And Congress enabled that to be characterized that way. So at that point, the franchise fee pivots from being a um, basically a rental payment for the use of rights away, something that you would expect to be uh, a normal part of a operating company's overhead, and went from that to being a tax imposed on cable subscribers by the local community. And, uh, and so that um, recharacterization of the fee kind of changed how people um, looked at it. And so um, after the DREGs settled in, then the cable companies um, started trying to figure out how they could pick away at the franchise fees a bit. And uh, so when people first begin raising the issue of, should we really allow all these communities to be charging their cable customers this tax? The question is, what are they using the tax for? 
Now, the local communities immediately said, hey, we need these fees because there's disruption in our rights of ways. Um, when people are digging or doing different things, that creates maintenance requirements. And so this is really just compensating us for our expenses. So at that point, uh, the legislators who were skeptical about the franchise fee that were in control, they said, well, let's find out if this is really true, whether they're really using these fees to fix the streets and roads and and do things that are related to the maintenance of the rights of way that um, somehow have been degraded by the providers being in those rights of way. And so um, you might remember they passed a bill where they told the utility commission, collect data from every community about how much they're collecting um, and where the money's actually going. And so every year now we get a report, it's usually in the, uh, the utility commission comes to a joint House Senate committee in the summer. It's an interim study committee that looks at utility issues. And so they, they come and present a big report about all the different utility industries that are out there, um, including cable and telephone. And they, uh, they put into that report the data they've collected um, about the franchise fee. So in 2014, they reported that there was um, 34 million three hundred five thousand. $513 collected in franchise fees in Indiana. 2013, before that, it was $38,260,072. $38, now, some of the, that data is a little bit um, sketchy because one of the things that I've learned, which is interesting, is you could put in a law a requirement that local units of government or police departments or whoever provide you with data, and half the time they'll just ignore you. Unless you put some kind of criminal penalty in there, like you will go to jail if you do not provide this information, they just kind of ignore you. And the local units of government were really kind of frustrated that the legislature was kind of meddling in their business. Right? So a lot of the organizations that represent the local communities, they kind of decided, okay, instead of you running around like your head's cut off trying to track where all your money's gone to and report this data up to the state, just tell them it's deposited in the general fund. And of course, the general fund, everything's commingled together, and then that gets um, allocated out by, the, by your local town board or city council every year. So a lot of communities just kind of told the legislature, heck with you guys, we're just going to tell you we collect it and it goes in the general fund, and you can figure out what you think about that. And so the utility commission reported that, and, and the number of people actually reporting data has been going down. So if you look at the numbers, you kind of have to factor in the fact you have less people reporting. And the idea is, I think that the um, cable industry and their allies in the legislature wanted to build a record showing that these fees aren't really being used to maintain the rights of way, or to somehow cope with costs imposed upon them by cable systems operating in their areas. And so um, that's kind of what they're after. So the Utility Commission basically reported that the fees are used for public safety, general operating expenses, and um, some right-of-way maintenance. Now, the interesting thing to me is they didn't, never mentioned access anywhere in their report. And I don't know if that's just because they didn't read all the reports carefully or so many communities are just saying, we put it in our general fund, you figure out where it's really going. But in my own community of Bloomington, we have a very strong commitment to access. We have three access channels. The local units of government want all their boards and commissions covered live as they're happening, as well as you know, record, um, replayed later. And uh, by ordinance in the city of Bloomington, 60% of the franchise fees are dedicated to access services. And in addition to that, we have a local library that stepped up and it's provided in-kind services with some staffing and also um, facilities. And so when the library was expanded, um, maybe 15 years ago, they uh, put in studios. We thought about how we could make it more efficient. And the, the city did the same thing when they um, uh, basically rehabbed an old furniture factory into a new city hall. We had a big discussion about how to um, make sure we had built-in cameras and a little control room. So instead of having people having to haul all the equipment over and set it up and have a lot of camera operators, you could have basically one guy show up, go into the room and basically direct the whole thing sitting in front of it and kind of remotely control the cameras. So you don't get that flavor of, of the communities that have a commitment to access or at least um, putting some resources into it. It's really not um, becoming very apparent, I don't think, to the legislature. 
And they also reported that about 48% of the uh, communities had a 3% franchise fee and about 44% were at the full 5%, which I think is a federal cap, 5%. And the others are kind of, I think, in the 1%, 1 or 2% area. And uh, they even reported that some, they found that some communities weren't even collecting the franchise fee, even though it was owed to them in, the, uh, in their contracts. They just didn't realize that they needed to be asking for it and maybe auditing what's going on. So, um, so that's kind of where things settled out with um, the utility commission basically saying they're just dumping in their general fund, using it for a lot of stuff not really related to cable TV or related to the maintenance of the rights of waste. And at that point then, suddenly the discussion changed, which is interesting. So now the cable industry came in, and they didn't really say, we don't like the franchise fee or we should get rid of it or somehow it's this unfair tax on consumers. What they basically said is like, okay, we got a big problem. We're competing with direct broadcast satellites, direct TV, dish TV, these guys, and they don't pay any franchise fees, even though they're providing the exact same service we provide, and they are um, competing with us head to head. We have this terrible burden of paying 5% to the local communities while the satellite guys get off scot-free, and you've got an inequity here that you as a legislature should solve for us. Now, they never mentioned that they're all just passing that along to the consumer and putting it in the bottom line. Now, they claimed that the consumers were factoring that into their purchasing decisions, which I highly dispute because if you've ever had a discussion with your cable company, about what it's going to cost. You know, you talk about what tier of service you're going to get and what it's going to cost you. No one, oh, and by the way, now that we've added up, here are all the fees that come with it. They never mention the fees. They're kind of like airlines. They don't want to really mention the fees. So, so I kind of doubted it was really having any impact on their business, but they were coming to the legislature and saying this is a problem. Now, the thing that made it difficult to solve the problem is the federal government had put in some of their federal acts that you cannot charge a local franchise fee to a satellite company. Because there were communities being to look around saying, well, well, you know, satellite people, it is kind of like cable. Maybe they should be paying us a franchise fee too. The Congress said, no, they don't use rights of ways. It's radio waves coming down from the satellite, and they're not in your rights of ways, so you cannot try to make them pay a franchise fee. Now, at the same time, because the U.S. Constitution gives states certain rights, including one, the right of taxation, they couldn't really say you can't put any fee at all. So what they were really basically saying is like, okay, states or local communities, if you want to get at some kind of fee from the satellite people, you have to have the state do it at the state level because they've got the constitutional authority, and it can't just be a targeted state franchise fee on a satellite company. It's got to be some kind of general excise tax you would apply to all video providers. It would be provided equally. So Congress basically said if you happen to have some generally applicable tax that impacts satellite and cable, other people, then you probably have that constitutional right, and we can't probably cut that off. But we don't want local communities telling um, DirecTV they have to figure out how many subscribers they have in the city of Bloomington and, and write a check. So the cable people came in and they said, you should even this up. And... Uh, the legislature, several bills got introduced over a couple years, kind of a flurry of discussions, and they were trying to figure out different ways that they could have a uniform tax that would apply to everyone. But in order to do that, they'd have to basically eliminate the local franchise fee, assess it on the state level, and then return the money down to the local governments to do it. So right away, there are many of us say, like, well, that's danger ahead, Will Robinson, on that one, because once the state gets the money passing through it, you never know what's going to come back through. Sooner or later, they're going to start, you know, stealing it, basically, and, and, you know, or putting all kinds of strings on it. So, so that was the first issue that got raised. It's like, you guys will end up screwing the local communities. It's only a matter of time if you have this money cycle through the state level. And then the, the other problem is like, you know, some communities are three, five, four, they're all over the place. And the question is like, well, so what should be the state tax level? Should be the max 5%, should be 3%. And then the, the majority party started turning itself into knots because they've all signed these no tax pledges that, you know, to Grover Norquist and this taxpayers union, they'll never raise a tax ever. And so the question is, is this raising a tax if you extend indirectly this franchise fee onto satellite? 
So then they're saying like, well, maybe what we should do is say that it should only be like a 3% tax, but if we put satellite in, that revenue will probably equal what the 5% communities are getting, and we can just funnel it back through them, and it'll come out as a wash, but then we can tell people we actually cut the fee. And, uh, but then they got tied in us and well, we just don't want to vote for something that looks like a tax. We think that's um, problematic. And then they came and thought about like, well, we could collect a uniform tax from everybody but then give a credit to the cable companies for paying a franchise fee. So we'll collect 5% video excise tax or something from all these people, but if they've already paid a 5% local franchise fee, they would get a credit for that, so it'd basically be a wash. And so some people said maybe we could do it that way. But I think that the reason why the bill bogged down is you had, um, you had a lot of local communities saying like, this is not gonna work very well in the end, you had people worried about, am I raising taxes or not? And then you had to kind of create this bureaucracy to figure out how you're going to credit all this stuff out if you want to try to hold the local communities harmless. So um, I think that that effort, which lasted for two or three years, kind of collapsed under its own weight. And it's interesting to me that um, I have not heard a peep about this issue now for several years. And to be honest, I'm not quite sure why. I have a few theories, but it's been very, very quiet in general the last couple years on the cable front and the telecommunications front um, to begin with. And I think one of the things that's happened is um, during this period of time, the legislature passed and the people put in the Constitution these t um, local property tax caps of 1, 2, and 3 percent. And for the first time in the past, the legislature had passed property tax relief bills, but they always found some other stream of revenue that would be provided as credits to um, provide funding that would be lost by any caps or limits on property tax. The Daniels administration basically said, heck with that, they're probably bloated and wasteful and anything to begin with, so let's make them be more efficient. We'll just take the money away through the cap. And it'll be good for them to go through the exercise of learning how to become more efficient and frugal, and that'll help the taxpayer out. So the caps went into place. And it's still, you know, um, impacting communities. So communities with very low assessed value, almost immediately they had problems because the people who were paying more than 1% of their tax were now capped at 1, and so their revenue was coming down. Communities like Bloomington, Monroe County have pretty good assessed valuation. People, there was room before they hit the caps. So the communities like ours are kind of slowly inching toward the caps, and sooner or later we're going to hit them. A lot of other communities, particularly rural communities, like hit them pretty immediately. And so I think the legislature, even though it won't admit it, um, the legislators, they kind of recognize that they have really put local communities in an untenable situation of having to find the revenue to provide the basic services that their um, citizens want. And so I think an attitude developed that like, hey, if they're getting some money, they're getting a couple hundred thousand dollars or something off of the cable company for the franchise fees and they want to just use it for general fund operating. That's probably not, maybe that's the governor. No. Um, they, I think they basically decided we should lay off the local units. If they've got other streams of revenue coming in, we know we heard them on the property tax stuff, so maybe we should just leave them alone on franchise fees and other you know, kinds of taxes they're collecting down on the local level. Um, and then I have another theory that um, perhaps just the cable industry and you know the telecoms in general have uh, just uh, had their attention moved to other places. So um, as you know, the whole net neutrality, open internet order thing has been a huge um, battle at the federal level. It's in the courts now. I think they see that as a real danger to their revenue streams and their future business models. So I think they may be focused in on that. And then you may have been hearing a little bit about the FCC now entering into a rulemaking to um, see if they can get competition for the set-top box so that the subscribers no longer have to just rent the DVR or the converter box from the cable company. So that's out there. So I think maybe they've just redirected their firepower and their efforts up on those federal level issues and they've kind of left the states alone for a while. So the good news is um, it's been very quiet. I haven't heard any rumblings of anything um, in the future. The last time there was a bill introduced to eliminate the franchise fee, it didn't move. It didn't get a hearing, which was um, a little bit surprising to me. So I think somebody was getting the message that maybe it's not the best policy. 
In the House, it's interesting because Eric Cook, a representative from Bloomington, has been the chair of the Utilities Committee in the House. And, uh, and as you might know, if you're chairman of the committee, you decide which bills live and die. You can really shape the policy within your area just by deciding what you're going to hear and what you're not going to hear. And uh, Representative Cook's, you know, pretty free market kind of guy. He's a member of the American Legislative Exchange Council, so he gets a lot of information from the corporations through those processes. If you know about, you may have heard about ALEC, but it's been a fairly infamous organization. It's uh, funded by corporations. More conservative legislators tend to join. They have a conference every year, and basically, um, if a corporation or trade association pays enough money, they get time with the legislators to tell them what bills they'd like in the past, and then they vote on model legislation. And then magically, states all across the country have the same kind of bill. So it's kind of a way to legislate nationally through this, um, this conservative group. And it's um, gotten a lot of uh, kind of scrutiny lately, and so I think its influence might be on the decline a little bit. But at any rate, um, Representative Cook is very open to the idea of these free market, less tax, less government approach to industries. And he is now running for the state senate. So there's going to be a new chair of that um, utilities and telecom committee, and it's going to be interesting to see who that will be and whether or not they have the same agenda or a different agenda and how aggressively um, they approach these things. Now, that utilities committee has really been pretty much dominated by energy issues about you know coal and clean energy and renewables and that kind of thing. So um, that agenda is crowding things out a little bit. So that's kind of my general summary of kind of where we are. And uh, if you have any questions at all about anything, I'd be pleased to try to answer them. And we can also discuss maybe how to try to influence the legislature as well. If I may, could I have mm -hmm. you speak on uh, if there have been any actions on IPTV? Uh, not really. I mean, there's the most of the IP stuff that has been discussed in the legislature. Again, this has probably been two or three years now. There was a point where the telephone companies, who always seem to be led by AT and T, were pushing really hard to get um, voice over internet protocol telephone service categorized as a non-common carrier, non telephone kind of service. They basically wanted to get the legislature put a rule place that basically said, if it's IP, it's the internet, the internet's not regulated, therefore no regulation. So I think that that same kind of um, attempt would probably apply to this idea of, well, what happens if they just um, provide video in some IP fashion, it's more Fiber internet. And such. Yeah, and that kind of thing. And, and I think that um, the legislature hasn't really delved into that too greatly. I mean, they, they had a couple of these runs at this IP um, kind of thing, but I think the fact that the federal government was having some test beds to kind of see how the IP phone stuff would work with 911 and a lot of other services, um, I think that they kind of backed off, and so we'll just see what happens on the federal level with that. And I haven't heard too much directly about um, the television side of that. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments? So, I, you know, I think we can probably all agree that there's a disconnect between the perception and understanding of importance for tech communities, um, definitely at a better, a larger scale level. But I, I kind of do want to talk about uh, how to influence and, at the local level. Hmm. What is your, I mean, it's nice that we have people in communities like yourself who are in, in positions of leadership and power mm -hmm. <laughs> that care about our issues, but there are so many that it's not even on their radar. Right. So how do you, I mean, for you, maybe this is a good place to start, for you in particular, how, what, what was your interest in, in these issues? Why, you know, how right. can we hook people in so that they're listening to us? Right. So I might be a little bit atypical in that um, I'm, <laughs> I majored, I have a telecommunications degree from IU. And I'm now on the faculty of the media school, and I teach media issues, so I track these issues pretty carefully. And before that, before I went to work for IU, um, I worked for the legislature as a staffer for 10 years. And during that time, I served on a city council for about three years. And before that, I actually, we had a um, cable franchise oversight board called it our telecommunications council in Bloomington. And we had written into our franchise agreement that 
the cable company had to have a representative at our meeting every month, and we would grill them about, you know, are the drop cables buried yet, you know, and, and then the access people as well would come and report on how many programs they had and what they've done. And, and so I had spent a lot of time within city government on this oversight board that saw firsthand what cable access was doing and the kind of the promise of it and, um, and what it could do for communities that particularly, um, you know, Bloomington's a fairly large community, but we're in the Indianapolis market and nothing gets covered in um, Bloomington unless it's sports or somebody's bleeding. You know, if there's some kind of cr violent crime, all the satellite trucks, you know, someone goes missing, all the satellite trucks will be there. You've got a big sporting event that, the, you know, with IU, the trucks will be there. But, you know, your everyday kind of government stuff, you know, not so much. And so I think that uh, an ethics developed in our community that recognizes that these access channels give you an opportunity to reach your um, citizens, your constituents, and give them the real news of what's going on. You know, what's going on with the water quality level? What's going on with the sewage treatment plant extension? You know, what's going on with the parks board? And, and so, so that's kind of what gave me a particular interest in it. But that doesn't mean you can't make other legislators care. And what it takes is a lot of groundwork before your issue ever comes up. Because once the legislature starts, and you hear, oh my God, somebody's put some terrible bill in, it's gonna be the end of us all if this thing passes. And now you're like furiously trying to get people to call up or email or talk to them. And it's a little bit of a contentious situation because people are usually, they're a little angry about it. And so it's usually like, you know, if you do this to me, I'm gonna like club you on the head and tell everybody you're terrible, right? And so it's, it's not the best, um, Climate and particularly if people, if you're dealing with a legislator from your community has a particularly deregulatory kind of approach or less government approach, you know, they might be open to the kind of legislation that would not be the best for access. So, what really is important is to just start building the relationships ahead of time. And I think the one thing that people just completely underestimate is if you call up your state representative, your state senator, and say, hey, I'd like to meet with you um, over coffee for 15 minutes to just let you know what we do in access and make you aware of what we do for the community. And oh, by the way, you could probably use this as well if you wanted to communicate out. And, and you know, people in Bloomington, I'm aware of it because all the candidates are asked to come on and do their five minute you know, um, pitch to people and they get played in rotation. So that's another entree level. But I, I think people feel that you know, state representatives, state senators are going to be like trying to get to see a member of Congress who's so busy and they've got 650,000 people they're representing or an entire state. And the truth is, unless you've got a legislator who's been in there a long time and just feels invincible and just gotten kind of tired, they're probably going to meet with you. Chances are they're not going to say no. And so that, so I would say that every one of you should just, you know, when you get back home, just call your state senator, state representative and say, hey, I'd like to meet with you and, and you'll make them feel better if you give them a, like a, a precise time commitment like I'd like to talk to you for 15 or 20 minutes or maybe half an hour or something and figure out where it's convenient for them to meet and then um, you know come and talk to them about what you do maybe have like a one page fact sheet you know um, legislators get bare with a lot of written material so people give us a lot of really nice packets full of information and the truth is we never have time to read through all of them and they stack up on our desks and eventually end up in recycling but sometimes a one you know if you got like a one pager or something you can hand to them that's something they can maybe hang on to that to remind them what it's about but that's first thing so you can basically say you know hey I'm not here to lobby on any one bill I just wanted to make you aware of what we do and what what makes this is this franchise fee and that there have been discussions in the past about whether this is important or matters how it impacts I just want you to understand how in your own community it would impact us if we didn't have the franchise fees mm -hmm. yeah my name is Bob Gross by the way and I just on your opinion with the background in telecommunications uh, realizing that for example uh, Indiana in, in their standards for education in the arts media arts are considered and mm -hmm. the arts. And also, there's been just in 2014, the uh, media arts standards on a national essential level have been put together. Do you see any connection there? I think it's a very, being an educator, I think mm -hmm. there's a valuable connection there. Uh, do you see any of that? 
Um, I had not directly put that connection together, but I think that's a very good talking point to let your legislators know about. If you're doing things with your local schools or providing content that can help with these standards and with education in general, I mean, education is probably the number one thing legislators hear about, and it's at the top of our priority list. Most of the time we're fighting about money and who gets the money, um, but standards do come into play. And I think that's probably a good feed into the second thing I'd recommend you do is um, try to build coalitions with other people to kind of do a similar thing. So, for example, in, in Bloomington, the library is very involved in access. So if I were to hear from the library director or somebody that's on the library board saying, hey, I just want you to know that we've made this investment in our library and these facilities and we do in-kind for staff and we're helping facilitate all these government meetings and the public to be able to put programming of their own on and that's only possible because we can partner with the city and the county which provide us a share of the franchise fees and again because people may not be aware of it that you know even if they see the cable access channel on their TV they may not be aware of all the things going on in the background that make it possible so if you have you know educators who you can kind of ask to I mean and you and you may not be able to get a library director, an educator to take the time to go lobby kind of on your issue because they may say, hey, I got to bug the guy next week on my issue. But you could probably at least get them to maybe send a letter or an email or something saying, hey, I just want you to be aware that we've got this great partnership going with Access and it's helping us with um, deliver these, um, you know, meet these educational standards. Then that puts it in the back of their mind. And then from your experience also, since they, these are art standards and you do have it there. Arts Commission, mm -hmm. uh, yep. would it be worth developing a coalition with them from that perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. I mean, the the kind of the the wider you can grow your circle of support, and the more grassroots you can develop, the better off you're going to be. And. So in a city like Bloomington, because we have, you know, decades of tradition of access and all the entities have bought into it and the communities come to rely upon it. I mean, I don't know how many times when I served on a city council, we would have some issue going and it'd be this really long debate. About 45 minutes into it, some guy would come rushing in the room like huffing and puffing. And he would say, I've been watching this on TV and you guys are such a bunch of idiots. I had to come down here and tell you exactly what I'm thinking. You know, it's like, okay, there's access, there's the access channel in action, right? So I, I could see it firsthand how it aids democracy and kind of fosters involvement in things. And so you just have to think of ways to bring that alive. So in Bloomington, it's easy. If I, if I start messing with access or don't support it, my constituents are probably not going to be very happy with me. Now, I know the, the problem you have is a lot of communities where, yeah, access is kind of there, but maybe they're not fully supportive of it or don't recognize the the capacity of it to serve the community so now you, you got a little bit of shaky support so anything you can do to kind of get them a little more fired up and and also willing to kind of help you communicate the legislator that that'd be a way to go yeah I want, I want to take your thought one step further and see mm -hmm. if you've got an idea because I'm um, I think in the communities where we work we have the relationship with most of our mayor city council mm -hmm. legislators like you have in Bloomington and I've you know I've seen Bloomington's website, I've seen you do meetings, my legislators, um, the three of them came in, did a live 90 minute sit down with me a few weeks ago, kind of wrapping up the legislative session. I don't think we have an issue in our communities. I think where we may fall short is we're so sporadic. There are 13, 14 access centers Something throughout like that. the entire state. From, from looking at it from your perspective, especially on a not you basis, how do we begin to help other communities kind of build that so we're not so sporadic and we can actually affect and impact more potential legislators? Because in our 13 communities, we don't have the votes to kill anybody. Yeah. Um, it is true that it's difficult if you have more, particularly more rural areas where maybe there's small communities and they have not invested in access. So I agree that's a challenge. Um, However, I think that um, the larger communities oftentimes end up with, um, first of all, they have more legislators in the rural areas because it's based on population. Um, so that's a little bit of a help. But if you can get influence with key members, so hopefully you're not completely frozen out. If you look at your, say, 13 communities or? It's, yeah, 
13 to 15. Yeah, so if you look at, you know, call it a dozen, whatever, um, communities, if you're lucky, maybe some of those communities have people that are in leadership, you know, maybe, and they have greater influence. Maybe some are committee chairs, and those are the people you really want to work hard because, you know, if the next chairman of the House Utilities Committee ends up being from one of your communities, you can immediately get on them, and they're a gatekeeper. So that can help overcome some of the things. Now, as far as um, getting local communities to actually do it, I th I, that's actually pretty difficult in this current climate because, um, as you know, uh, people are starting to dump cable and go more towards streaming. So you're probably going to have a natural fall off in the franchise fee revenues. And we've already talked about how those communities, if they are getting franchise fees, they're probably using it for general operating. They don't have access to because they're trying to overcome these caps and things. So I think that the only practical way that you would get them to dedicate some of the money that's going to general operating to something that would allow access to occur is if you um, got kind of a grassroots movement going with those communities. I think that's the only way it has to happen is you have to have somebody willing to organize People in the community like to be able to watch their local units of government in action live from the comfort of their own home and see if you can get a critical mass of people that, you know, maybe the next time you have local elections come around, if you had a group that said, we want access, and you went and you asked every, you know, candidate for city council or town board, what is your position on dedicating, you know, maybe even put together a little bit of a plan, a little bit of a business plan for how it would work. Are you willing to dedicate you know, 25% or some amount of the franchise fees to help cover this cost. And, you know, politicians never like to disappoint people at election time. So that's the best time that, you know, the next six months is the best time to ask legislators if they'll support you and what they care about because they don't want to make anybody mad. And so it's, I think it's a similar thing with local officials. So I think that if you can figure out a way as an organization to look for some communities you think might have the wherewithal to do it and then see if you can find some local community people you know and, and it's great if you can get like the Kiwanis club president and the kind of people who aren't really like politicos but they're very in, they're community leaders you get those kind of people saying hey we'd really have a lot better democracy around here if we knew more what's going on well, I was just gonna add um, I mentioned that I'm a board member of Citizens Action Coalition I actually I don't know if you're familiar with it or if you're in Indiana, but we do uh, lobbying on the door around the utility issues. We were formed in the 1970s, and so we um, work to make sure that we as consumers are, you know, given a fair shake with our utility rates, be they electric or um, gas. But we've also been involved in some telecom issues, and we were opposed the Telecom Reform Act in 2006 in Indiana because part of that was the deregulation of local telephone service. Um, I became involved again um, because I had been involved in a multi-year effort where we did a lot of the things that you suggested that you do to build support in the community to get public access television back in Indianapolis. And as we did that, we kind of had the rug pulled out from under us when we went from the local franchising that we were fully prepared for to this to state model. Um, one of the things we had worked out with Citizens Action Coalition, because they do do the door-to-door -door canvassing, we had put together a, um, a, a kind of cheat sheet of the benefits of Access TV, that they were actually going to go around door-to-door -door and talk to people about to help our effort, because they saw that as something that would be beneficial to them. Um, and then kind of reconnected again in 2006 with the, um, with the telecom reform in Indiana. Um, but when I talked to the executive director on my way here yesterday, you know, he was kind of saying that we know that these are some issues that we should be paying attention to um, around access television and so forth, franchise fees, but it's not our core mission. And so if we had someone who's kind of stand on top of those that could kind of say, hey, this is something to keep, to be aware of, because we're at the state house, you know, through the whole entire legislative session. We have a lot of relationships. We um, work with the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, Commission regularly. We have some of those relationships. And it's not necessarily a friendly environment, but we've got people who are experienced doing it. And so just like saying that I think that there's some potential that if we can do more organizations so that we're not so reactive, um, that I think there's some potential for working together. Um, the executive director's name is um, 
Herman Olson was saying that it's like every year at and or Verizon come in with some fix to the, you know, the telecom bill which was supposed to be so perfect in and of itself. And he said by the time he sees it, it's like a grease pit. You can't get a hold of it, it just sails right through. But that we've got to figure out how to be more proactive so that we might have some, can prevent maybe some big nasty changes that just slip through without our being aware of it. And as far as trying to develop access to new locations, I mean, I think it does, like most things, come down to money. And I'd say maybe the, maybe the advantage is that um, you can scale some of these things up with fairly low cost. You know, now that we do have streaming, you know, maybe if you just have, you know, server and some streaming capabilities, and I think the camera technology and things gotten a lot cheaper. I mean, we have people doing some fairly amazing stuff just with their cell phone cameras taking video and things, and so maybe, there's a way to put together some proposals that will get your foot in the door to at least maybe start to stream some things and maybe get the local community to purchase, you know, a server and a couple of cameras or something and create a bit of a structure. And then from there, once people get a little bit of a taste of how that works, then maybe you can extend that into the cable, the more traditional cable access realm where you're actually getting a channel dedicated and, um, and some of that franchise fee stream coming through. So that, that's one advantage, I think, because usually all of these, you know, whether it's city council or mayor or whoever, kind of the first thing they're going to ask themselves, like, what's this going to cost me? And then they're going to compare it to all these other needs, which they're having a hard time meeting, and like public safety is right on the top of that, you know, just keeping the police and fire department, you know, paid for is a challenge. So that's, that's kind of what you're up against. So maybe the technology is evolving. On one hand, this is um, a little bit what I teach about at IU. I mean, it's a crazy situation. On one hand, you see these new technologies kind of destroying, you know, this creative destruction thing. They're kind of really blowing up the way things were, and you're thinking like, oh my God, this is just gonna destroy everything that we built for the last 30 years. But on the other hand, there are opportunities within that, that the technology is, is democratizing things, and it's cheaper, and it's not quite, you don't have to be quite the technician to pull it off. And so th the key is to figure out what's the transition. How do I figure out how to get from here to there to the new technology so that I come out the other side still existing it may be a little different business model different way of operating but we're still here and we're still providing that core function that we were before any other questions from the group i have one question mm -hmm. what have, have you seen anything in terms of the um the number of channels or access centers how they've been impacted by the 2000 you know, I, these guys could probably talk to it more than I can, but I, you know, what I've heard is that, you know, they immediately stopped any kind of capital things that were within the franchise fee where they would buy cameras or facilities. They seem to back out of that pretty immediately and just really try to use the, the deregulation of the state franchise any way they could to limit what they have to do. But I'm sure you probably have a long list. I, I can actually speak on that. Uh, and, and you're right that any of the local communities that had a capital caveat on top of the, the regular franchise fees, those disappeared immediately. There was also at least eight different centers across northern Indiana, uh, starting with South Bend, heading into the Chicagoland area that got shut down within a matter of Oh, three months after the 2006 bill went through, uh, South Bend was one of those centers that that uh, was was eliminated. Hammond, Dyer, the whole, all through the Chicagoland area, they they lost quite a few centers. Uh, we went from having I think probably 40 centers statewide to now we're 13, 14, somewhere in there. So it had a devastating effect. Does the National ACM have numbers on that? John Hauser does. Yeah, yeah we should <laughs> get those in, in like floods maybe, or I don't yeah. know how we could share those, but just so like you guys have them, have them, that you can sit down with your legislator and say, hey, look, this is a 15 minute coffee chat, <clears throat> yeah. and I really want to bring up how bad this and for a couple yeah. of years, we, within the Alliance, especially Indiana, we've been trying to push uh, the sentiment you mentioned earlier that the cable companies change the vernacular on the franchise fees from being a rent to a tax, and we work on trying to change it back over, you know, and, and we use the, the explanation of, you know, you're, you're renting in an apartment, 
in a building that your landlord has paid off. Well, just because he doesn't have a mortgage payment doesn't mean you don't have to pay rent any longer. And so that's kind of the equivalent of the franchise fees for the rights of way. Just because they've paid off and we've already fixed all of the rights of way, their stuff's still in somebody else's land. It's rent. And, and so we've been working on that, but I think the, the cable companies have a little bit more ability to spread their version of the story. It would, it would be interesting if the National Association had the data to kind of compare the states that jumped into the DREG around 2006 and then how that, you know, the before and after on facilities and then the, the states that chose not to go that route that preserved the local franchising authority, kind of where, where that is. I think that would be really telling because I, quite honestly, I don't think that discussion or that story has ever been told <clears throat> to the legislature. That, that downside didn't get fully communicated, I don't think. I can speak on when that was all kind of going on. Uh, we have members in the room, we're from the four state region. Uh, Michigan mm -hmm. was watching what was happening right. here because as it was going through the Indiana legislature, it was being proposed in Michigan. And so there was a team of people from Michigan that came down and attended some of the hearings with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were watching it very heavily. And Michigan has a much stronger PEG presence. Can you guys say how many? There's rough estimate? Including all of the E, like strictly education and some of the universities and schools, there's like 60 something. Well, that's our members, that's 60 members. And there's some that are just government, so that's in TOA. So I put together a list. This was when I first started in ACM. That I think we had almost 150 stations known. Now again, it could just be government, it could just be education mm -hmm. or schools, or it could be PEG. And, and what I've noticed over, I've been in, in PEG for 16 years, it's a lot easier for some of the government and educational centers to continue to thrive because they, they have that, that built-in purpose. Right. You know, the, the government at access centers are helping with clarity of government and people get to watch, as, as you said, the, the people storming in on the, the council meetings. And then education, you know, access helps with teaching kids media literacy. So there's, there's, it doesn't seem to be that there's as much of a challenge for the E and the G, but it's the P. And, and the right. thing about most of the public access centers, at least within our region, they are community involvement centers and they are training centers. And, and I can speak exactly of some of the operations that they have at Access Fort Wayne where they have a public computer lab and people could go down and get training on how to use computers and you know, when, when the 2008 uh, stuff, you know, the, the economic collapse happened and everybody needed their unemployment. They go down to the, the library on the computers that Access Fort Wayne uh, operated and, and handled and they get help with filing for their unemployment and finding new jobs. And so there's a lot of, there's a, a whole slew of accentuating services that they offer that go along with just the cable channel. It's never just channel on TV. There's more to it. And, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. And I, you know, I have to admit too that, I mean, it's just staggering how quickly all this media stuff is changing, but even my own habits. So when I, when I got a DVR and then they put all the high definition channels up on like, you know, one set of channels and the access is down in its old analog position. So what I found is I don't really channel surf anymore. So in the old days when you had 36, 54, maybe even 98 channels, you'd like, you know, go around the, around the horn. And inevitably, you'd stop on a city council meeting and you'd start watching it. And an hour later, it's like, I can't believe I, you know, if somebody said, are you going to watch city council tonight? It's like, no, that's not on my to-do list. But you, you see something. And now what I find is um, most of the stuff I'm taping on my DVR and I'm just watching it when I get around. It's almost like an on-demand thing. And I don't really surf the channels anymore. And so I'm actually watching a lot less access than I, than I did before because of the way I'm interacting with my set now. And, and this, that leads kind of to some of the, the issues that, that PEG has been facing on a national level. 
uh, the DVR works exclusively off of the channel guide mm -hmm. and, right. and most the, peg channels at least in Indiana aren't included in the channel guide yeah. I formerly had the responsibility of updating the one channel guide out of three channels that Access Fort Wayne was allowed and the interface with that channel guide was horrible you know and and to update one day's worth of schedules sometimes would take me two or three hours and I'm just trying to copy and paste something from an Excel sheet, yeah. you know, 18 lines, a couple of hours. I don't have anything else that I need to do in, in the process. And so the, the, the DVR is, is either left not knowing that PEG exists. And so mm -hmm. if somebody does want to record something that's on PEG, their DVR is telling them no. And, right. and then we have the situation with AT&T. They created their U-verse, and what they did to peg channels on the U-verse, yeah, they're, they're thrown into an app, and then they're squished and compressed and downgraded. And so AT&T U-verse customers have, you know, an entire slew of HD channels, mm -hmm. and then if they decide that they want to watch peg, they have to dig for it, and then when they find it, it looks horrible. So we don't even get, and, and it's part of the, the legislation, I think, we're supposed to be broadcast at the same signal qualities right. as everybody else, but and, that just never materialized. And, I, and this is, um, I've complained bitterly about this, at least I did for a number of years after the bill got passed, but um, the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, which is now the franchise authority, will not enforce the law. Unless you hire a lawyer and you file formal proceeding and you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of your money, or at least tens of thousands of dollars of your money, lawyering up and going through this really long process. And, you know, I, I intervened once on my own. I have a law degree um, against AT&T because they were trying to keep secret where they're actually providing the service. And... Uh, that thing was like a roller coaster ride because you got they've got PhDs, they got the National Corporate Council, the big city indie corporate council, they got the regulatory people, and they just it's like a flying wedge, and then they try to intimidate you by dumping all these interrogatories on you and they want you to spend like, you know, all day long answering stuff. So so I, I would always complain and say, you know, if I call the Department of Environmental Management and I say my neighbor appears to be violating the environmental laws, they're spewing toxic, you know, goo in their backyard, I them, you know, if it's credible, will come out and look at it. And if they're violating the statute, they'd say, hey, you, you got to get with the law here, right? But if you call the IURC up and say, hey, the law says they have to provide access at the same level, you need to enforce that, their answer is, well, you'll have to start a proceeding. And then we can, you know, lawyer up in three years from now. And then, and then the other thing is the uh, Court of Appeals, um, that's the other thing that the, the Consumer Council will tell you. Because the, then I'll go to the Consumer Council, like, why aren't you guys, as the Consumer Council, and this is maybe what you could agitate on. Maybe it's time to, you know, who knows, maybe there'll be a new Consumer Council at the next election, but you might want to make an appointment with them, is I go to the Consumer Council, why don't you guys be the ones filing these proceedings? You've got lawyers here and you're getting paid by the taxpayer why don't you get this law enforced and they're like well we know we're just going to end up in the court of appeals because even if we win at the commission they're always going to appeal the courts and we have a terror you know the courts are never very kind to us so we're going to expend a lot of energy trying to get the peg channel up to the proper resolution when we could be spending that money on discussing duke energy's rates or you know the michigan um you know, nuclear power plant, how they get separated or whatever. So that's, that's the dilemma that you're in. But I've been very frustrated about that. And I actually asked the Comcast lobbyist about the viewer guide stuff once, and their answer was like, well, we offload that all to some private company. And, um, and they acted like it would be this, you know, monumental technical chore to get it done. And well, they do. They use their prairie services. I'm in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and we mm -hmm. are on the guide. Roe v. A-list? Yeah, Roe v. It's the key guide. The, the most frustrating thing, and I think one of the big points of kind of what you both are talking about, is that we are the majority of our peg centers meet the technical standards that are required to do this stuff. We're ready. Mm -hmm. We're here. We've got the stuff to just okay. Let's we can our our 
technology outputs the data for those guys. Yeah, and it's, it's frustrating. And, you know, I spoke on this at a conference not that long ago. Um, but one of the things that I was talking about is I would imagine that CNN, ABC, they don't have to do this system, mm -hmm. the program guide. No one's sitting in an office yeah. typing yeah. in manually. So what is the difference, you know? It's really, I mean, I know in our community right. we have better, uh, yeah, I can say this is a safe place. We have better technology than our local CPS affiliate. I mean, that's the reality. Like, yeah. on a large scale, mm -hmm. much better technical hardware. With, with some of the advancements of, of consumer technology, and, and I work for LTV in Fort Wayne, uh, so I'm part of the school system, and our equipment, I go out and about, and I have the same exact camera as the broadcast networks. Mm -hmm. uh, but my signal still doesn't look nearly as nice as theirs, even though we've got the, the equivalent equipment. Mm -hmm. And, and earlier during the course of this conversation or this conference, there was a conversation about, you know, it's possible in the upcoming years to decade or two that the cable companies might have to switch us over to HD just by the sheer fact that those old SD equipment parts that they're using to broadcast our signals mm -hmm. are starting to get old and wear down and break right. down and they can't get parts and, for and, and I'm SD you. equipment. Right, and the only reason they're doing that is because they want to charge an extra 10 bucks a month for HD when HD is now the standard, it's television. I've never understood how they act like they're giving you something special. It's like the old NTSC standard is gone, you know. It's, yeah. So, you can't even yeah. buy standard def new stuff anymore it's just not right. around even the the you know smaller consumer grade i see the the letters hd staring mm -hmm. at me right, right over there so right. everybody my, is my cell phone claims it's 720p so <laughs> <laughs> i don't think i've ever tested it but yeah. claims so, yeah i have a question more for like you guys because um i'm also from michigan and we have a group of telecommunication lawyers who at first they were like scary to me but come to find out they have our backs like they really do so do you guys know who those lawyers are in Indiana and you're communicating with them I know um, for example so I'm saying no not we not don't you. have a WhatsApp you don't have a WhatsApp you don't have any telecommunication lawyers that would stand no well, I think we have them some background. well she might know yeah protect yeah. pro tec and they're uh, Kind of a consortium of whatever, yeah. and it's about public right of way. So, mm -hmm. so they're into cable franchising, tower placement, mm -hmm. mainly the community, local community can control their right of way and all these infringements by the telecommunications companies going to the legislature to get those laws removed or mm -hmm. lessened or whatever. So right. Or what? My guy named Mike Watts of Michigan is part of that, and we're real familiar with him. So does Indiana have something? Um, I'm not aware. I know the citizen. I know the Citizens Action Coalition. They have attorneys that work on the rate cases that they challenge. And so the, I've, through the years, kind of talked to a couple who had some more interest. Um, I think at this point, we've got a unique situation here in Indiana. So that I know that when we were before we went under the the state franchising, we were really looking to a lot of lawyers outside of Indiana who had expertise with federal law to help us you know, move the needle, if you will. Now, I mean, I'm looking at you, you've got a lot of expert, you may be our... <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, kind of a, I'm kind of a pretend lawyer because um, I've never practiced law and I did um, just represent myself when, when I um, interceded in that one case and it was a little bit of a nightmare because I'm sitting here trying to figure out, you know, how do I get the little headers the right way, you know? So something that would take, you know, a real lawyer with maybe a paralegal about two seconds to get the software pull up, I'm like, actually, oh, damn, the margin's not quite right, you know? And, you know, and oh, I got to number these lines. How do I, I don't remember how to do that, you know? So, so uh, you know, certainly I think that there might be a way to find some people that have some background in communications law but they're probably gonna to need to plug into somebody who actually has some experience practicing before the commission. Because I, I do think that a really good project might be if you could find a couple pro bono attorneys that like a fight for the fun of it, is to file some um, petitions with the commission to basically say, 
these guys are not con consistent with the law. You know, the resolution's not right. They're not following the letter of the law and force those guys to have to come in. And that'll kick up a little bit of a, of a storm. You'll probably end up in the courts, which you really do need a real lawyer at that point before the Court of Appeals has got to do an oral argument. But that's going to get some people's attention. And what will immediately happen then is AT&T will rush over to the legislature and say, you need to rewrite all the laws to moot out this lawsuit. You ne we need to basically block these people by throwing all these legal obstacles up. And that then creates the conversation. If you've done your, your groundwork with all these legislators around the state, now you can have a discussion like, you know what? Let's talk about how we can make access stronger. Let's not go the other way. Well, there are two specific cases in Michigan, and they have more information about this Watson. He's actually a private attorney mm -hmm. that gets hired by municipalities. So I don't think anybody actually is uh, paid by their staff of Protect. I'm mm -hmm. not sure on that. There was a specific case, and we're talking maybe six, seven, six years ago, that uh, municipality of Marine Township in the city of Dearborn, and there might have been one other, who went in against Comcast because Comcast was reintroducing the set-top box. And what they were going to do with the access channel is put them in a tier that wasn't available to everybody. Mm -hmm. So they actually had a legal ground to stand on. They yeah. found a yeah. favorable judge, I think, at the federal level. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear in the federal law. It's supposed to be on the basic tier. But they, uh, it cost them a hell of a lot of money, and they were yep. knocking on doors to different municipalities to chip in and help them. And uh, I could get my municipality to join in because they're like, well, what do we do with the appeal? No, you're exactly right. And I did the same thing in, in Bloomington, and my friend was the mayor. And I would say, like, why don't you guys, you got a couple lawyers over there, why don't you sue these damn guys at the IORC? over? Because it took, like, 18 months or longer to get 18, get a peg on at t because they were arguing over who's going to pay to plug it in and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and, you know, the mayor is just like, okay, how much money am I going to expend in staff time and then probably having to hire some outside counsel because it's kind of specialized practicing before the utility commission. It's not like going into your local court across the street. We're in the county seat. And, and so you're, the most rational decision being made by your elected official is like, how many of my constituents care, uh, you know, if you ask them in a poll about the resolution of access or channel location? Now, yeah, they'll... they'll They'll care in the abstract that it's available and it looked good, but if you give them this list of priorities of where to spend your money or have a big fight, it's difficult for a mayor to justify the time and the expense and, and the involvement. And, and knowing that, and I saw this too, even when I had a lot of authority as a local franchise when we had the, uh, the 92 law, you know, we had rate regulation and stuff, and I was battling TCI, which was the biggest cable company at the time. And even then, I had a hard time pulling my city along with me when I would say, we have the federal authority now to limit late fees and to do some different things. And um, it was just difficult because he said, well, you're, you want to pick a fight with one of the biggest corporations in America, and they can just bleed us dry. And even if we win on this level, then we've got to go up in the court, and, you know, we just don't have those resources. So there, need, there needs to be a, a way that maybe you can pull a small amount of resource each person Find a, a somewhat public spirited attorney with the right skill set that, you know, if they can get their expenses reimbursed, they'd be willing maybe to put a lot of free time in just because they kind of like to have fun, you know, doing battle with the big guys and maybe setting a precedent or something. So that's, you know, maybe that's a pipe dream, but that's one possibility to pursue. If I can pull this back to, to Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we've got an election coming up, and there may be some changes in who chairman of certain mm -hmm. things are, from your status as a legislator as opposed to a lawyer, mm -hmm. would it be something that you and some other legislators in, in a couple of our communities might be willing to at least help craft what could be a possible amendment that if PEG legislation came up, franchise fee mm -hmm. legislation came up, there would be some amendment that could help carve out at least right. those communities where PEG exists and is doing well to kind of at least in some way try to keep us whole, it might be voted mm -hmm. down. But if there's something there, I, I saw how fast the last short session mm -hmm. moved. Right. Um, my legislators were saying, you know, three weeks before that thing started, they basically knew what bills were going to come up, how fast they were going to come in. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we're thinking this is going to happen once this legislation, legislation starts, those things have decided before day one you all are in there. Yeah. But is, is that something that 
sounds somewhat reasonable in trying to be proactive. Yeah, we, At least keep right. ourselves whole for where we are right now. Yeah, you could, as just as like a procedural matter, you could clearly send me kind of bullet points of the kind of changes in the law that would be advantageous to you, whether it's resolution, channel placement, kind of thing. So one of the things we could do, which we haven't done, is under the federal law, the IURC now is the franchising authority. They have the ability to put in customer service standards over and above what the FCC has kind of laid out as the basic level. So you, you could go back and direct the IURC to kind of do some stuff to make sure the resolution is right and the placement is there. And, you know, that's not a problem. If you send me kind of your wish list, I can have that drafted up in advance. And then, but the real heavy lifting then is how do you get the thing passed? As I've introduced many an amendment, and I've usually worked, you know, fast to get them prepared, and, you know, it's kind of me against the world. And you make your point, and then you get, like, you know, blown out on the vote. So that's where if we can get this, um, you know, kind of, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word here. If you can build your relationship with the local legislators, so at least in these 13 communities, and a lot of times if the community is a little larger, they've got a number of legislators. It's like a Fort Wayne, they've got a ton of legislators there. Indianapolis, ton of legislators. You know, Bloomington, now the way they've drawn the maps, Monroe County, we've got, you know, four or five legislators to come in there. So you would be surprised at what a critical mass you might get to with just those 13 people. So if you can build those relationships, it, make sure they understand the service you provide, maybe explain to them how the way this DREG bill got implemented, you have been marginalized, things are not working out the way that people perhaps think. You at least you got maybe your hooks into them. And then when it comes up on the floor, <clears throat> we can coordinate and you can go back to those legislators and say, hey, remember me? I met with you last summer and we talked about big access. Well, there's a really important amendment coming up that I need you to vote for because it would really help improve our service. And now that legislator, when he's voting on the floor, it's like, okay, there's somebody watching back home. And if I just vote with my AT&T friends who maybe fund my campaigns, somebody back home is gonna notice, and maybe they got 10 friends they talk to, and before I know it, I got a little bit of a problem. So that's the kind of grassroots kind of support you need. And then, if you, and then the next level is if you have the ability somehow to communicate with the people who actually watch Access or the people who Put, create programs and put them on the air or the public officials who enjoy the fact that they're on their local access channel and people mention it to them in the supermarket, get those people on board and build that up. Then you have a chance of actually getting that, that amendment passed. So as a matter of drafting in advance, I mean, that's not too hard to do at all. And, and to be honest with you, the, act, the actual mechanics of getting an amendment ready to go, although it can be a little daunting if you've only got like a day or two to put it together, the real issue is just having the political support on the floor so you can actually get the thing voted and kind of get it in there. Do we have any other questions? I think that's it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure, thanks.